December 29th, 1980, 9 p.m. Betty Cash was driving a car along a lonely road outside of Dayton, Texas. Betty's accompanied by her best friend, Vicki Landrum, and Vicki's seven-year-old grandson, Colby. Suddenly, as they're driving along this road, they see this flaming object in the sky. The bright light hovers 60 feet above the road. She gets out of the car to get a better look at this object, and suddenly she feels burns all over her body, and, and Vicki and, and Colby also felt burned. As Betty starts to get back in the car, she struggles with the door. The side of the car, the metal of the car where she put, put her hand was, was searing hot. The intense heat is not the only strange thing Betty encounters that night. Then these helicopters come out of the blue. What are they? They look military. They were chasing or, or uh, accompanying this object as it was moving away. In a state of shock, they head home to recover. The entire experience lasted only about 20 minutes, but it would change them for the rest of their lives. Shortly after returning home, all three began to experience strange symptoms. Betty Cash, in particular, gets sicker and sicker and sicker. Her hair started coming out in patches. So she finally goes to a doctor who says, you've got the same kind of reaction that the residents of Hiroshima and Nagasaki had who were not immediately incinerated by the atomic bomb. When Betty Cash first leaves the hospital, she is determined to find out what happened to her. So she calls NASA for help. The Johnson Space Center denies any NASA involvement in the incident but they put her in contact with one of their engineers, John Schusler, who runs a voluntary investigation program called Project Visit. Project Visit was very interested in trying to prove that the UFO phenomenon was real. Investigator John Schusler returns to the scene of the incident. Schusler's investigations found, among other things, that the road in question appears to have been uh, dug up and replaced with fresh asphalt within a short period of time after this incident. Schusler searches for signs of the radiation that could have caused Betty's illness, but finds nothing. Undeterred, Schusler moves on to the helicopter angle. He contacts local military bases to find out who and what was flying that night. Every single local base in Texas said nobody was flying helicopters that night, so it wasn't us. They weren't lying. They didn't. Flight data records confirm this. Schusler's investigation hits a dead end. Years later, Dr. William Burns also investigated the incident. He discovered that President Carter had set up a secret stealth helicopter unit at the end of his presidency. Burns believes that Betty's encounter could be related to the development of a top secret nuclear powered aircraft. That's what they were experimenting with. The nuclear reactor overheated, caught on fire, threatened to, com to melt completely. So they called on a top secret helicopter unit to fly to Texas, chain the thing, go out over the Gulf of Mexico and drop it in the water. But some observers are not convinced. It raises more questions than it answers. Maybe it was a secret American system, but I don't think so. And while a nuclear accident could explain Betty's radiation sickness, it would also leave evidence, evidence Schusler never found. Something strange was there, a true unidentified flying object doing peculiar things and where the government lied about it. But until the military releases new information, Betty, Vicky, and Colby's terrifying encounter will remain unexplained. Yukon Territory, Canada. Retired government grain inspector Jim Conacher and his wife decide to spend one morning of their vacation on Lake Taggett. Jim and his wife are going up along the shore and about 300 meters away, they come upon these uh, four bright uh, 
orbs or objects four feet in diameter. Objects seen as lights during daytime would have to be very bright indeed. The four lights move over the treetops, heading upwards towards the area of the mountain where the other three lights appeared, seemed to join with them, and then moved off. On returning from his vacation, Conacher decides to find out what the strange lights were. But according to investigator Martin Jasik, his research hits a brick wall. He had the um, slide submitted to uh, the weather office who submitted to the Department of National Defense. The Conachers were not the first to see these lights. They've been reported all around the world, and NASA wants to know why. 200, 300 years ago, people sometimes described in great accuracy the same phenomena that we are observing today, and therefore I believe that these lights are a warning sign that something is happening dramatic. On August 15, 2007, the phenomenon causes terror in the skies above Lima, Peru. In Lima, an airplane was in the approach, and the pilot was actually then reporting to the tower, I see lights all over the place, here and there and there. The plane lands safely, but reports of more and more lights in the sky flood in from all over the country. And within hours of the sightings, Peru gets hit by a devastating tectonic event. There was a magnitude eight earthquake in Peru, equivalent to several hundred thousand uh, atomic bombs exploding at the same moment. For Freud, this is the smoking gun. He studies 400 years of earthquake history and finds hundreds of accounts of the strange lights foreshadowing disaster, including prior to the great San Francisco earthquake of 1906. I believe that these lights are a warning sign that something is happening at the Earth's surface, which is a result of something even more dramatic happening deep in the Earth's crust. Could this explain the strange lights that Jim Conacher saw on July 1st, 1973? Jim didn't know what the lights were and never found a satisfactory explanation for them. On the same day that Jim spotted the lights, a magnitude 6.7 earthquake struck the coast of Alaska. The epicenter was less than 200 miles from Jim's position. 